Hey, good evening, everybody. We're really glad you're here. My name is Paula Creation, and this mic is really loud, so I apologize. And I'm president of the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. Um, our community, all of us, whether you live in Porter Ranch, Chatsworth, Granada Hills, or Northridge, or any of the surrounding areas, have all been through a crisis together. And we continue to try to navigate this together to find good answers. And that's what we're here tonight to try to get good answers and good solutions, not only for the now, but for our future. So that when you guys move back in your homes and your children and grandchildren are playing in your yards, you're going to feel safe. And that's what we're working towards. So I just want to thank you for being here tonight. Our host is Pastor Beverly Rutherford, and he's going to come up and greet you. Good evening. Let's try that one more time. Good evening. We want to thank you. Uh, as Paula mentioned, my name is Dudley. I'm the pastor here, and we are honored that you are here. We're sorry about all the construction, but uh, that's going to take a few more months before all that's completed. I also apologize for the stage, but uh, before Easter, we have a thing here at the church called the Passion Play, where we show the last week of Jesus' life in Broadway form. So that's why that all looks like that, so just so you know. Tonight is all about information. You're going you're gonna to hear a lot of information, but the main thing, and they'll stress this, uh, the government officials and legislatures that are here, they're going to give a lot of time to answer your questions. They're going to let you ask questions, and they're here to answer your questions. You've got them, I've got them, and uh, we've been waiting for a night like this to get the government officials. We do not need or want to berate them. They're here to help us. And so when you ask those questions, be kind and considerate. And uh, I know some of you are frustrated, but we're praying for you. We're praying that that, that leak gets fixed as quickly as possible. And uh, we pray for all the people on this stage, that they will come up with solutions and be able to help us and encourage us. So I hope when you leave here tonight that you feel encouraged, that there's a lot of people working on this. So I'm going to turn it over to Mitch Englander, which is our city councilman who represents this area. And uh, he, along with all these people, have been working tirelessly around the clock to fix this problem and to help you. So would you please put your hands together and welcome our city councilman, Mitch Englander. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Rutherford. Um, really appreciate it. Before I say anything, I want to say this. I want to take the time to thank a few people that really deserve a tremendous amount of not only respect, but gratitude from all of us. First and foremost, this leak here, this disaster, this catastrophe isn't just here in Porter Ranch. Uh, apparently the leak doesn't know zip codes and people in other areas have also been complaining and relocated as well. But your neighborhood councils, particularly the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council led by Paula, who has just been tirelessly working on your behalf, is incredible. But her whole team and the entire Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council, as well as Chatsworth and Northridge and Granada Hills, all the stakeholders that have come together in the homeowner associations. If you think about what LAUSD did in just a few weeks by relocating the students, and I know it's really difficult to deal with that. I know how complicated that is, and I've been over at the schools as well. But the teachers that work through their vacations to set up the classrooms, and for those of you that haven't been out there on site, you would think those classrooms were there for years. I met with a lot of the students, and they were just happy to be back at school. They didn't care what school, as long as they saw their friends. So we're going to get through this. And there's two words that I want you to think about as we do. Never again. This will never happen again. Um, and so the way that this never happens again are by these folks right here. Our lives, our future is in their hands in making sure not only that this leak is stopped and getting the answers to all the questions and the frustrations that we all have but working with our regulators, toughening the laws, changing the legislation. And I know um, we have our senators and, and uh, assembly members here that are going to speak a little to that and what their hard work and what they're doing in both in, in Sacramento and certainly the folks in Washington to change this forever, to make this 
and continue to make this one of the greatest communities to live and work and raise a family. Um, I love living here and representing you as well. So hang in there. We'll get through this as we have with every other major disaster, and we've been through a lot together. We'll get through this as well. So thanks for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce, uh, I guess am I introducing the next, yes, uh, Fran Pavley, please, come on, come on out. Let's give a big warm welcome for our state senator. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Pleasure for me to be here. I'm Fran Pavley. I'm your state senator. And um, I feel like my car knows the way here. This is my third time. Several of you were there. We had a press conference with Senate Pro Tem de Leon, Senator Bob Huff, as well as Senator Ben Allen to announce a package of bills uh, relating to make sure, as Mitch Englander said, this will not happen again, and we want to get this right. But I also wanted to acknowledge the hard work of my staff. This isn't the first week we've been out here and attending meetings or holding meetings in my office with Save Porter Ranch as well as the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council leaders. So please uh, join me in thanking my staff who's here, Rosalvo Gonzalez, Dusty Russell, Henry Stern. They're all here tonight giving up a Friday night. <laughs> Your hearings last week, uh, my staff attends it. We post things on Facebook. You've probably seen that. We have a uh, way to link to the legislation so you can see what we will be doing regarding making sure this happens again. I'm very concerned that after the leak stops, and it will stop, after it leaks stops and the media goes away, people may just forget about what happened here. Carrying legislation to provide that oversight, hold agencies accountable, hold elected officials account accountable is incredibly important as we move forward together. So if you're interested in looking at the package of legislation, and I've had nothing but good feedback, uh, we'll be glad to provide to you that information. Uh, the first part of the legislation is an urgency item. It requires two-thirds two vote of the legislature. And before those oil wells continue pumping natural gas into the reservoir, they're going to have to prove that it's safe. <laughs> PUC, CEC, and others will look at this, signing off on it, and we'll have an independent review. That legislation should be heard in the next week or two in the legislature. It was introduced last week. And again, I welcome your input on this. But I also wanted to give a shout out to Paula, as everyone else will. She uh, is amazing because she has an ability to encourage us to do more, not abrasive, but sincere, uh, passionate on what she's doing and has a great way to deal with elected officials as well as your community. So I, I appreciate that and so does my staff. <laughs> Finally, those people sitting behind me, most of them coming from far away are spending the evening with you because it's important to the governor, it's important to myself. And a special shout out to Wade Crowfoot, who I believe is over here. He's the Deputy Secretary for the Office of Emergency Services. He's the one who's done a great job at coordinating all the other agencies so that there's one website, one voice to disseminate information in a timely way. And that is for your benefit, but also for all our benefits so that we work collaboratively together to solve this problem. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attendance, and I look forward to listening to the questions you have. I'm here to learn from you. Pleasure and honor to represent you up in Sacramento. And also in Sacramento, uh, your assembly member is Scott Wilk, and uh, Scott was in my office for an hour or two on Thursday, and we were talking about the legislative package. So I'll be working closely with Scott on this. Thank you, Senator. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this evening. I wish it was under better, better circumstances. I want to thank Pastor Dudley and Paula and Shepherd the Hills for, for hosting this. It's an incredible venue uh, to, to do this in. And as Senator Pavley said, this issue is not a Republican or Democratic issue. It's about us. And I am going to be co-authoring her series of bills because, as, as 
uh, Councilman Englander said this should never happen again. Uh, I'd like to quickly uh, introduce my staff. I have my district director, Chris Hoff, Tammy Stevens, and, and Patsy Ayala from my staff. They're here to serve you. Uh, I'm, right now, if you, if you are going through the relocation process or other things with Southern California Edison, and they are not uh, meeting uh, your customer satisfaction, I'm going to give you my personal cell phone right now. I want you to call me, and I will be your advocate with them. So my personal cell is area code 661, number is 713-4794. Give it to you one more time. 661 713 Four seven nine four. A uh, couple quick shout outs and then I'm going to be off. One, uh, the Porter Ranch Town Council. Uh, they're keeping everybody's feet to the fire, so they're doing a great job representing you. And then I also want to thank Governor Brown for putting this together. And we have tremendously talented people up here, uh, you know, agency heads and, and people with, the t with technical skills to answer your questions. I'm going to sit here in the front row uh, with Senator Pavley and take notes and learn from you. And again, if you have any problems, Call me. That's what I'm here for. And again, thank you for attending tonight. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Gillarducci, and I am the director of Governor Brown's Office of Emergency Services. And I'm going to kind of MC um, the event tonight uh, to help you um, be able to hear from the panelists and also uh, so that we at, at, up here can hear from you uh, and be able to share information back and forth. But before I start that, let me just say that. I've, I've been doing emergency services for about 30 years, and um, I've dealt with and responded to many disaster situations, both natural disasters and man-made disasters. And I, I can tell you this with 100% confidence that at the worst of times, I have seen communities time and time again come out and, and the best of the community comes out to be able to rally around uh, 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 each other, the issue, to be able to come together, to be able to solve the problem. And I will tell you this also with 100% confidence, that these, this issue here, like every other disaster th that I've managed, is not just a government solution. It is a whole of community solution. It is us working with you, you working with us. We are collectively, we are the community. And it takes a community to be able to respond to recover and to ensure that the future, that in the future, we do not see these kinds of things again. This is very critical. Now the governor and I uh, were here about four weeks ago, uh, went to the site, uh, and then sat in, and had the opportunity to meet uh, with the Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council uh, board. And, um, and, of, and uh, of course, as you know, uh, shortly after that, uh, the governor did proclaim a state of emergency. Um, that does not mean that there was not a lot of action beforehand. In fact, from, the, from almost the, the moment of, of, uh, of, of, of the knowledge of this event, there were uh, many um, uh, responders, state agencies, uh, local government, uh, re responding uh, to begin the process of working with Southern California Gas to ensure accountability, to make sure that they were doing everything they possibly could uh, to, to, to fix this problem, to stop the leak. And now uh, the governor has directed us uh, to, tonight to ensure by sending down uh, his top level cabinet officials uh, to sit and talk with you tonight to ensure that not only everything that is being done continues to be done, but that in the future, as we move forward, whether collaboratively working with the legislators in introducing and supporting legislation, uh, through the actions through the emergency order uh, or and in fact ensuring and absolutely holding accountable Southern California gas for all of the recovery that's necessary to get you and your lifestyle and your homes back online and that you build that confidence back in that you live in the beautiful community 
uh, that Porter Ranch is in a safe and secure environment. So with that, I want to introduce tonight to you um, the various panelists that have come down as a part of Governor Brown's cabinet. Um, president Michael Picker, uh, who is the president of the California Public Utilities Commission, um, uh, will, will be speaking shortly. Secretary John Laird, who's secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency, and many of the departments and agencies that are actually responding to um, on the ground to be able to deal with this particular crisis. Secretary Matt Rodriguez, who is the Secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency. Um, Executive Officer Richard Corey uh, from the California Air Resources Board. Uh, Chief Deputy Director Drew Bohan from the California Energy Commission. And Chief Deputy Director, Director Janet Jason Marshall from the California Department of Conservation and Acting Director Lauren Zies from the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. So all of the agencies that are working on this event, uh, in including mine, uh, are here. Uh, the heads of those departments, the, the leads of those agencies are here to speak to you tonight um, about uh, actions and moving on in the future. So with that, I'm gonna have each of the uh, panelists present a little bit of information to you. Uh, but the bulk of the night is going to be spent with you uh, sharing information with us. So with that, let me start off by introducing uh, President Michael Picker of the California Public Utilities Commission. Thank you for, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I've had a long week, so I'm just going to stay seated, and it'll also probably make it faster so people don't shuffle back and forth. Um, the, the Public Utilities Commission is first and foremost an economic regulator, so we set rates for the use of the storage facility for different cust and figure out how different customers are going to pay their fair share. About 25% of the storage is used for residential gas for heating and uh, cooking in people's homes. Another 25% roughly is used for electric power plants through the, the uh, basin, including uh, 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 Burbank and the city of Los Angeles' power plants, a uh, couple other uh, public agencies in, in Southern California Edison. And about another quarter goes to uh, petroleum and, uh, and oil facilities for their use. And uh, the other 25% is pretty much split up. And so we, we have some very specific safety authority over gas pipelines, things that are close to the surface, but nothing below the wellhead. So when my staff first told me about this, I knew that we were actually going to have to work with the agencies who actually know more about wells to be able to get to solutions. And, and they had already been active on this, the Department of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Research. But we immediately start wellhead. So when my staff first told me about this, I knew that we were actually going to have to work with the agencies who actually know more about wells to be able to get to solutions. And, and they had already been active on this, the Department of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Research. But we immediately started to, to work with them. Now, while we don't have a lot of legal authority on wells themselves, we have a general authority to ensure that utility infrastructure is both safe, that it's reliable, and that it's affordable. And so we take that safety responsibility very seriously, which is why we actually started to work with the, Div the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources to try to find solutions. We're pretty active on four different levels. And the first is to get the well closed. That's actually the most important thing right now. But we're also, and have been for some time, tracking expenditures. At, at, at some point, once we f understand better what caused this, we will, um, um, we'll, there will be cost allocation and, and, and potential penalties. It's early to, to say because we are, have just started the third area, which is, is our in investigation in collaboration with the Division of Oil, Gas, and, and Geothermal Resources. Both of us have slightly different responsibilities 
and the information that we need to actually take action on them are, are going to be different. But we've been working very closely with the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources to make sure that we're asking this, the, the, all the questions, that we're sharing the information, and to the extent possible that we're sharing the analyses so that we'll both be effective when it comes to, 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 to taking any kind of enforcement actions that might result from an investigation. There'll be several steps for us. Um, but the fourth area that we've been very uh, busy on involves our energy division. And that's that, that, that ensuring that the infrastructure is, is reliable. And because many different users depend on the gas that's at, at, at this facility, we have to begin to plan now for cold events. We need to plan for the use of gas for electricity into the summer. And we need to begin to plan for next winter when people actually need that a source of gas to be able to provide for their home heating use and cooking. So those are the four things that we're most focused on. And if we get to questions, I may be able to answer some of them. But at this point, I'll turn the microphone back over to Director Goloducci. Good. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Secretary John Laird of the California Natural Resources Agency. Thank you very much. And for those of you that don't know the Natural Resources Agency, it's 19,000 people protecting the resources of the state, well known as fire, delivering water uh, uh, to here, energy, parks, fish and wildlife. But what is most of issue tonight is that the Department of Conservation with the Division of Oil and Gas has been on the ground from the first day of this deals with the regulatory and uh, transparency matters through that division, and the Energy Commission uh, also deals with gas, gas sustainability, certain issues. We have the Chief Deputy Director of both departments up here uh, to answer questions, and we have a new director who's been on for days who is watching Ken Harris by webcast tonight and has been working really hard to get up to speed the way the rest of us are on this. And I think the, the just one thing I wanted to say, is I have a long career of many decades in public service, and I was an elected leader of the city of Santa Cruz when a few years before Northridge, when we had a 7.1 earthquake that destroyed our downtown, closed it for two years. Uh, hundreds of people were dislocated from their house. Uh, businesses, we worked hard to keep going. And I had a similar experience when I was in the legislature where the largest underground contaminated spill of perchlorate in Northern California was where 1,500 people had their own private wells. For years, they could not use their water for their personal use, shower, drink, animals. It had to be bottled in. They had questions about safety. They had questions about the varying readings. They had questions about when it was going to end and it is somewhat analogous to this, and so I knew my role in those situations and my role in this situation is to bring the sense of urgency of people that don't necessarily have answers, that are dislocated, that wonder how the effects on them, whether it's their property, their health, their kids, where their schools are, how the urgency of that being the life experience every day is reflected in the agencies and how they deal with this provide information, ride herd on it, and help people work through to get to the end. So I am anxious to hear from you, and I think that's going to be very important to us in doing our jobs, in making sure that we have everybody tuned into the right place to make sure you know what we know when we know it as we move forward. Thank you, Secretary Laird. Uh, next is Secretary Matt Rodriguez, the California Environmental Protection Agency. Yes, thank, thank you very much. It's, it's uh, a, a privilege to be here today talking to all of you. Uh, I am the secretary for the Environmental Protection Agency, um, and I, I know that y you're hearing a bewildering number of agencies and departments and boards mentioned here today. Uh, within Cal EPA, 
Uh, we have uh, uh, six boards or departments or offices, uh, including the Department of uh, uh, Toxic Substances Control, the Department of Pesticide Regulation, um, uh, and importantly for tonight's purposes, the uh, Air Resources Board um, and the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments. Uh, just a word on my role. Um, I, I came to Cal EPA from having worked in the Attorney General's office for 24 years. Um, and what I see my role as is to, to, to make sure my uh, uh, boards and departments and offices within the agency are, 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 are implementing uh, the, the laws that have been adopted by our legislature. But importantly, it, it's also my role to make sure that we're all working together uh, and that we're all working collaboratively. I was uh, uh, mentioning to uh, Director Ghilarducci that uh, uh, you know, we saw each other on Tuesday when we were in San Diego to discuss uh, water quality issues and potential flooding issues down on the San Diego border. And I was there with uh, other representatives from uh, uh, the agencies in California. And, and uh, Secretary Laird participated by phone. And yesterday we were discussing water quality issues and how we're dealing with water uh, supply issues in California, and uh, Secretary Laird and I were on a uh, panel together uh, yesterday. So uh, part of my role is to make sure that we're all working together. Um, in this particular instance, uh, there are uh, two parts of uh, uh, California Environmental Protection Agency that are playing a role in, in dealing with uh, the gas leak situation that we're, uh, that we're confronting right now. Uh, first off, there's the uh, Air Resources Board. Uh, the Air Resources Board uh, deals generally with air uh, quality issues in, uh, in California. Uh, importantly, they uh, are responsible for our climate change uh, programs, they're uh, responsible for monitoring uh, emissions of, of greenhouse gases, including methane. Um, and in this particular case, uh, the governor has uh, uh, very appropriately assigned them responsibility for doing monitoring and monitoring uh, the uh, air uh, in, in, this, in this particular vicinity. Uh, we have the executive director uh, with us uh, uh, tonight, uh, Richard Corey. Um, and Richard was telling me that uh, on uh, the Air Resources Board's uh, website, you can find uh, actual uh, uh, data on uh, emissions, uh, both methane and benzene, uh, on their uh, website uh, going on uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, the leaking well here. Um, after uh, this work is done and this, the uh, well has been uh, dealt with, uh, the Air Resources Board will also be responsible for working with uh, the Energy Commission, with the Public Utilities Commission, uh, with the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources to uh, look at our laws uh, governing this kind of uh, a gas storage facility and make recommendations on what we should be doing to better regulate these areas, make changes as necessary. So that will be the role of the Air Resources Board. Um, also, they'll be looking at the question of uh, how do we mitigate uh, from a climate change perspective, the emissions of uh, methane that have gone on here. Uh, the other uh, uh, entity that is represented here uh, tonight is the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments, uh, which is a mouthful to say, uh, but they play a very, very important role in California and, and a, a unique role uh, actually in many ways. Uh, uh, not many states have the benefit of an office like this one. Basically, what we have uh, in California is an office composed of, of scientists who work with the other agencies in California to do peer review of the work that they're doing, to make sure that there's a good scientific basis for the work that's done by the Air Board, uh, by uh, the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, they also implement Prop 65, so uh, if you pick up a, a product that says, uh, uh, this product is a, a product known to the state of uh, California to contain a chemical uh, that is a, a reproductive toxin, um, or, uh, then that's, that's because that has been identified by the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments. And as I said, they also review the programs and the work done by other agencies. 
uh, and, and they don't have an axe to grind. They're there to just make sure that there's a scientific basis for the decisions that are made by those agencies. Uh, tonight, we're fortunate to have with us uh, the uh, director of uh, the office, uh, uh, Dr. Lauren Zeiss. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Dr. Melanie Marty, who is a uh, deputy director at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments. And we also have Dr. Uh, uh, Boudreau, who is uh, here. And he's a division or a branch chief, um, and he specializes in dealing with air issues. Um, they've done uh, an analysis uh, just uh, recently of uh, the uh, air data that we have had available uh, to us concerning this particular gas leak, and they'll be continuing to look at this, uh, uh, the air effects as, as time goes on. Um, and uh, uh, under the governor's proclamation, uh, they will continue to work with the agencies to assess uh, the uh, health impacts of these uh, emissions. Um, and importantly, they've been uh, um, uh, asked to, to set up a panel of experts to take a look at the uh, health uh, impacts. Um, and that panel, uh, the uh, direction came out uh, earlier this month, but uh, today the announcement went out on uh, the doctors that will be part of that panel and the experts that will be part of that panel so we can get started as quickly as possible to look at the health impacts. So, uh, that's an overly long uh, preview, but I wanted to let you know where Cal EPA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments, and the Air Resources Board fit into tonight's uh, 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 program, and we'll look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Okay, well, so now is the part of the um, presentation where we want to hear, start to hear from you. And um, let me just start off by saying, you know, we understand how serious this is. The governor understands how serious this is. Um, and um, uh, we definitely want to hear from you. I want this to be uh, 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 an opportunity to get information. Um, there's going to be microphones that are be going out here. Um, uh, if we're, we're hearing multiple of the same kind of questions just to keep the, the, the dialogue moving on through the night, um, we'll, we'll make a point of that. Uh, as you ask questions, I will um, present uh, the microphone to the most appropriate or, or the number of different peoples who have uh, information to share with you to be able to answer your question. Um, and um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes the rest of the evening. And so with that, let me just uh, offer, if you'd like to stand up and uh, ask a question, please come to a microphone and we'll, we'll begin. You can line up. Okay. With that, sir, we'll start with you. Oh, George O'Connor, Porter Ranch. Yeah. Okay. SoCal Gas has given me filters in my house, charcoal filters, to filter the air. Will that take the um, chemicals that are in the air out of my house. Okay, good question. Air Resources Board, be the most appropriate uh, person to ask. Can I have uh, the Executive Officer of the Air Resources Board? Yes, uh, thank you. What we've done is we've looked at a range of uh, air filters and looked at the effectiveness of air filters and identified those for Southern California Gas, calling out and put this information on our website, those that are most effective at capturing the, the organics, mercaptans, uh, H2S, other substances that we're talking about. We're also, in fact, this step didn't happen today, it's happening early next week, are including recommendations on the frequency at which those filters need to be replaced. So in other words, you have the base piece of equipment, but then you have material in them that captures the uh, organics those need to be replaced periodically. Those two activities couple with one another. Recommendations on the filters that are most effective. Recommendations on the number of filters. In other words, depending on the volume of the house and if it's one or two stories, two filters or more, it, it requires two. And the frequency at which those uh, uh, absorbents need to be replaced are, are the counsel that we're providing and we're putting that out for the public to see and, uh, and, and, and are, are providing the associated documentation on the best equipment out there. So I mean, is that a yes or a no?
I, my characterization is we're confident those filters work and capture the material. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am? Ma'am? Yes. Oh, sir? Um, Sorry. The, yeah, it's that. It's a light thing. No problem. <laughs> follow up um, on, on that. Follow up on that one. I, I understand these are gas, uh, they're electrostatic filters. Th those filters are good for capturing particulate matter, like small particulate matter, not methane. So I, 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 I really wonder about that. The, the, the filters you're installing are for particulate. And this is a this is a gas. It's a carbon gas. How do how does the particulate filter work on a carbon gas? So that's my first question. The real okay. Hold on, this Richard. Then, and then I just I, I just want to add my other one. Then okay. I'll sit down. Okay. The other one is, I understood when this first started. You 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 established a zip code and said this is the zip code we're interested in. I used to work in the oil and gas industry. How come you did not do dispersion, air dispersion modeling to see where this gas could go? How far it could go? Where is it going? Okay, thank you for the question. With respect to the question about a particulate filter versus one that captures organics, the filters that we're identified and identified on our site are capture organics. They have a specific, specific adsorbent that is intended to capture organics, and we confirmed the effectiveness of those filters at capturing specific organic chemicals. So the, the, in addition to the uh, filtration of particles, the mechanics of those filters is to capture and hold organics. Okay. About the, the, six, the issue, question on the zip code on air monitoring? I, I got to get more background on that particular question. Okay. So we'll, we'll put that in the parking lot, we'll come back to it or be able to follow back up. Specifically, it's not about monitoring, it's about dispersion modeling. Modeling, yes. Modeling. Got you. Okay. This side, sir? I have three questions. Okay. I live in 91344 zip code, Granada Hills. Should I worry about the air condition? Okay, this first question has to do with Granada Hills and um, the air atmosphere in Granada Hills. You know that one? So Lauren, hold on. We, hold on. We have more. Hi. Um, we have measurements taken in Porter Ranch of different chemicals that we have looked at and compared to health values that we are pretty certain w would not cause an effect. But in those comparisons, we are currently below any levels of benzene in particular, and some of the other air toxics that we would anticipate any health effects. Whether the concentrations in your area are identical, I can't answer that question. Who can answer? Anything, Richard? Okay. I all right. I think I. I said so, another one. We um, I think what what we can do is um, take a look at your area, take a look at the distance from the site, and get back to you on that. Um, and what we're trying to do at OEHA as we make findings is to put them on our website, so you can get at our website through the general OES website but we will be looking at the different locations and considering the extent to which the chemicals that are emitted disperse to them. I, I think I should add also that we have a technical panel of experts and a couple of those experts are in exposure assessment. So we will be looking more at how these chemicals have moved through the air. Okay. Second question, sir. Okay, who do I talk to if I have a system and a suggestion to cap the leak? Who do I talk to? I need after, a, after the event, you can come up and talk to, to us. I'll, I'll be happy I need to talk to one or two particular people who are interested in that area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that would be the okay. Division of Oil, Gas, Geothermal Resources, Jason Marshall, two to my left. Um, and so Jason is here tonight, but he is also up in Sacramento. I'd like to talk to you if you don't mind. 
Third question, BP oil leak in Louisiana area, it costs billions, and BP came up with the financial no problem. There was a talk here that there might be tracking expenses and potential penalties and all that. Now, is there a chance that the gas company can go bankrupt and just walk away from it? Michael? I, I don't think so. Good. But let's Great. wait a while before we start to, to, to be sure about that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, with respect to our elected officials. Mike. Is this okay? Yes. Thank with you. respect to our elected officials who are here tonight, um, who spoke about um, never again and what happens after the leak stops, I think the issue for most of us, um, Senator and Assemblyman and Councilman, is, is now. The only person, the only person who spoke with the word urgency was Secretary Laird. So the question for our elected officials is, what are you doing now? Legislation down the road doesn't help us. <laughs> sound bites, sound bites and photo ops in front of the Aliso Canyon facility don't help us. What are you doing now to help us? For example, what are you doing about diminution in house values? What are you doing about those of us that are, are still paying gas bills to, to the people that are poisoning us? What are you doing about, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll finish my questions and I, I'd like to hear your answer, Councilman. What are you doing about our neighborhoods where our kids can go out and play in the park? I was talking to my wife today. She's afraid to go take a walk for fear of being poisoned. Okay, let's so let him respond to your question. What are our elected officials doing? No, those are the questions that should be asked. Absolutely, and I, and I appreciate you asking them. Because one of the things I didn't want to get up here today is just rattle off and say, let me tell you every single thing that I'm doing and my staff is doing every single day. For those of you that don't know, let me just tell you a little short laundry list. First of all, I live here. So I'm going through and experiencing the same thing that many of you are. More importantly, more importantly, every single day, we start the day at 5.30 in the morning. We get on the phone, and I'm not going to walk you through every day. We get on the phone with a conference call. My entire staff and team is both on a call with SoCal Gas throughout the day, as well as a lot of the regulatory agencies. More importantly, what we did first and early on <clears throat> is I set up a community advisory committee that if you're not familiar with, how many people are familiar with the Porter Ranch Community Advisory Committee that we've established? Okay, a, a few of you. So what we did is I appointed members of this community from Porter Ranch, Northridge, Granada Hills, West Hills, to all to get together with the HOAs and save Porter Ranch. It's live stream on the internet with the gas company because no information was coming out. The information that was coming out not only was sparse, but it wasn't believable, and I think to this day, it's still not. It seems like it's one step forward and two steps backwards. The most important thing is making sure we get information and disseminate the information and get this closed as soon as possible and restore what this community is. There's no question. So it's not the rhetoric and it's not never again. The first thing I did is I went up to the site and I met with everybody there and said, what are you doing to getting information out? What? You set up a 404 number. I'm not even sure what state that is. We, need a, not a, we don't need a local phone number and a table on Cessnon. We need a storefront where people can actually show up to get relocation information. So I put together a hearing. I negotiated the lease at the Porter Ranch Shopping Center. I brought them there, got it opened. We have two sites now. We opened up our office and then we filed a lawsuit with the city attorney on behalf of all of you to make sure that they would follow through to get you reimbursements, full relocation, make sure those, not only the elderly um, and the disabled and those with special needs had special treatment immediately, but to speed that up, they had two relocation companies, they now have 17. Um, on top of that, and there's a long laundry list that's on my website without rattling off all of those things, the most important thing is this. I'm working very, very closely every single day with every single member of the community here as my staff is. We have been on the phone 
Every day, our office, we, we opened up our office to depositions, in fact, where we brought a team of city attorneys down to the office to call everybody in and say, if you, if you would like to join this, not our lawsuit, because there, I think there's enough lawyers out there spreading enough fear and uncertainty and doubt as well, and they're doing a good job at that, um, but to actually file one on behalf of the people of California to hold them accountable and make sure they get this stopped immediately. We've been successful in getting those implemented in stipulated orders to make sure that those things can be done. I've attended every single town hall that they've had here, not only the ones that have been put on um, by regulatory agencies, but I've shown up to every single event. Uh, so I've done a lot, but let me also say I've worked very closely with our state uh, legislators, Scott Wilk, who's here, um, our Congressman Steve Knight, who's on his way here back from Washington. In fact, it, oh, he's here now. Just flew in. I was on the phone with him right when he landed from LAX to come, come here tonight. Uh, we get on the phone every single day and talk, and our staffs talk every day, uh, as well as uh, his staff with Dante Acosta, who's here, Senator Fran Pavley's office. But outside of the rhetoric, outside of the rhetoric, I think the most important thing is this. Shut it down and make it safe. I'd like to thank follow you. like a quick follow up. Quickly. Um, Councilman, I appreciate the shut it down mentality, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. Lawsuits, as everyone in this room knows, are going to take years. Nothing's happening now. What is happening right this minute to make us whole? Uh, just uh, two specific things that I'll mention without going through everything. Um, one thing that we've been able to do in the last month is to make sure no new gas is coming into the reservoir. So the pressure on the reservoir has dropped down substantially, which has reduced the emissions. It's not the final solution, obviously, but it did s stop the emissions from increasing. The moratorium, the bill that I am carrying, and we've been in session one week, you have to realize this, and it's an urgency item, which means it could be passed within the next few weeks and on the governor's desk, would say unless and until these key agencies and independent reviewer can prove that you can put in additional volumes of gas in that reservoir and make sure it's safe so that we won't have another leak again, no more gas goes in there. So the long-term solutions will be taken care of afterwards. But the first priority, stopping the leak, and then making sure that we investigate all these older wells, especially those that predate 1953. And if they are not safe enough with their pipes and their seven-inch in integrity of their well casings, then they should not be allowed to continue. So our, our agency, excuse me, our office and the legislature is fully engaged now. You have our intention. We are paying very close attention to doing everything we can, in addition to providing oversight over the agencies, which is our job. And, and I would add that uh, the, the governor's emergency proclamation uh, bolsters what Senator Pavley is doing. And so a moratorium is in place now. Um, that no new gas will be injected into Elizo Canyon until the regulators actually complete a comprehensive uh, a safety review with independent expertise uh, to demonstrate that it is safe and independent experts validate that the air quality in the surrounding community is safe. There's an open question and obviously there's a lot of folks in here that, um, that want Aliso Canyon shut down. Uh, and that's one, raise your hand if that's, if you're, just to get a show of hands, okay. So that's, that's one clear, uh, uh, clear sentiment that we're taking back to Sacramento is the, is the intensity of, of uh, your, uh, your advocacy on that. Toward that end, the governor has directed a lot of the people up here uh, to come together to assess the future viability uh, of Aliso Canyon and other gas storage fields in the state. Um, the fact is, President Picker has explained that um, these gas storage fields can't disappear overnight. 
or there would be impacts to actually heating our homes, turning on the lights, et cetera. But uh, the state is committed to actually understanding um, what should be the future of Aliso Canyon? What should be the future of these storage wells? Is it feasible to shut Aliso Canyon down? Is it feasible uh, to shut uh, other uh, gas storage fields down? And as the governor, and I think Mark told the neighborhood uh, council, uh, you know, we're very open-minded. All options are on the table, but it needs to be fact-based, and that's what that, uh, that's what that report will provide. <clears throat> Thank you, Wade. <clears throat> Thank you. Ma'am? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to first say that I've been a member of the Porter Ranch community for over 35 years, moved my family into the area. Beautiful area, clean, fresh air, blue skies, sheep grazed along uh, Tampa Boulevard. And by the way, when we bought our homes in the area, there was never any disclosures about the Southern California Gas Company. <clears throat> This was true not just 35 years ago, but also even in the last few years. No one knew about it. I literally found out that the largest um, natural gas reservoir in the western United States was literally in my backyard. I never knew about it at all. Um, today, by the way, we have to disclose if we attempt to sell our houses, and we have to tell about the gas leak, and we have to tell that people are becoming nauseous and sick and nosebleeds. It's actually in the disclosures today. That's unbelievably startling. We live in earthquake country. You've heard of the Northridge earthquake. How ever was there the largest reservoir of natural gas in the western United States right at the epicenter of a major earthquake. We live in a fire area, which my understanding, which I just found out a little less than a year ago, that the Southern California Gas Company actually was the perpetrator of one of the largest fires that we had up here, the Cessnam fire. So this, this is my question. Who issues the permit who made the decision to give the permit to the Southern California Gas Company? What type of safety check was done on 115 wells before issuing the permit? Is there a 20-year renewal about to come up for the Southern California Gas Company and the Aliso Canyon Reservoir? You're shaking your head. That's what we've heard, so you'll, you'll let us know. What type of regulations are there or should have been? How close can a massive 84 billion cubic feet of natural gas be to homes, residents, schools? 150 wells with corrosive pipes, old oil wells not properly encased, not properly prepared for natural gas storage. I saw in the LA Times today, I was absolutely shocked to read the article. Have you all seen the article? I have it with me. They said that whatever the Southern California Gas Company has done so far, that they've actually made it worse, that they've actually broken into more area of the hillsides, and that it's becoming more and more dangerous. So you get a copy of it, I have it with me. Um, I personally cannot see any other solution, and I understand how difficult it is, and I know it will take time, but it cannot remain here any longer, not with this many homes and this many people. And for the... <laughs> we... We know that it's going to take a great deal of planning, and I know my time is up, but it'll take a great deal of planning to try to find another area, but it needs to be in an area that's not inhabited by human beings. This does not work any longer. So I guess the main question maybe to PUC is what's happening with the renewal of it? Because we've heard that the 20-year renewal is coming up very soon. Thank you. 
I don't believe that there is a 20-year renewable, but I will check and I'll make sure that it gets on the website so that you can you can you can see. But okay, I but don't believe that there is a 20-year renewable. Okay, is there any renewal coming up of the lease? Not that I know of. I, I could. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, the the okay. director of the safety and enforcement division, okay. uh, Elisa Vita Malashenko. Okay. But I uh, I'll just say that yeah. my we don't generally issue a permit with a term for it, it, the, so. the reason I'm asking you is that when I was at the meeting a couple of days ago, uh, someone representing Supervisor Antonovich, I asked, are the Board of Supervisors in charge of the permits to continue leasing the, the land? And they said, no, it was the PUC. So that's why I was asking you. Um, thank you very much for your question. Emily. I'm Elisa Vera Malashenko. I'm the director of the Safety and Enforcement Division. I'm going to uh, speculate a little bit, which I'm not supposed to do, but uh, to try and answer your question. Uh, the original permit uh, to uh, SoCal Gas was issued in the 70s. Um, when the, these types of permits are issued, they don't have a sunset date. But as Southern California Gas Company uh, makes uh, uh, improvements or any changes to the facilities, um, they apply for, um, for modifications that basically extends the permit. So we've had a, um, one of those applications for which the work is still ongoing. So that's one area where some of the confusion may have come from. And then we also every four years have what's called rate cases where the company comes in and asks for more money. We are currently considering one of those rate cases at the commission. So again, that, that could have been another uh, sort of case that we have that could have introduced that notion. But to our, both of our knowledge, there is no such thing as, a, as those permits that have a 20 year expiration. So it's probably one of those cases that somebody <clears throat> was referring to. I, I can answer that question about what she's referring to. Thank you. She's probably referring to, I, I, my name is Matt Pacuco from Save Porter Ranch. <laughs> DWP and the city of LA are quietly negotiating another 20 year renewal of, DW, of SoCal Gas providing gas to the DWP for power. I believe that's the 20 years that she's talking about. Okay. Thank Franchise you. agreement. Okay. Thanks. Yes, Secretary yes, Gillard, if, if I could respond to, um, to the question with regard to the wells. Um, uh, there's two things um, that I would, I would respond to, um, ma'am. Um, first off, I completely understand um, the concern. The wells in Aliso Canyon are subject to uh, annual inspections. Uh, many of those wells are uh, vintage wells. It's well known that some of them were built in the 1950s. Um, those inspection standards, um, by emergency regulations that we issued today, those inspection standards are going to be upgraded, and I think it's self-evident why we need to make sure we do that. But with regard, but with regard to your, your question about the LA Times article, um, the, the article um, stopped short of, of making one important point, and that is that each time that the well control has been attempted, there were seven attempts, the most recent one being in December 22nd, um, the, the well has been resecured. And indeed, today, the well has been resecured. The well head has been resecured. It is cabled in place and anchored by, by cement. Um, the securing is to make sure that it does not wobble. Um, and the well head is competent and it is holding pressure. So it, the well is stable today. Um, and it's going to, we believe, stay that way because we have indicated that we will not uh, be interested in seeing, and I don't believe that SoCal Gas is either, but we have said to them, we don't want you to make any more attempts to, to, to kill the well from the top down. That is the, the, the source of, of potential damage. We are looking to the relief well as the means to control that well. And, and we're hopeful that when they do the intercept by, on February 10th, that is their schedule, and then they begin the, the pumping operations, that that will, will be successful. But that is, that is the state of play today. The wellhead is stable, and, um, and we think it's going to stay that way until we get to the place where the well is controlled completely.